Mickey, Mickey's a pure substance. Water's a pure substance. Nothing but hydrogen and oxygen. Now, if you go down to the creek and you take a sample jar and you scoop up a sample of water, is that pure water? Oh, no, 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 no. We've got all sorts of interesting things in it. Um, you know, good stuff, fine stuff. Nutrients, nutrients, nutrients. Um, mud, silt, particles, you know, whatever. But if we take that sample and we purify it, we get rid of all the other stuff, and we're down to just the H2O, we can take that sample, we can stack it up against the sample from the top of Mount Everest, from the Arctic, from Mars, if you're the lucky person who discovers water on Mars, from, what's the moon of Jupiter that's got water ice, they think? There's one moon of Jupiter that I think they believe has water ice. I'd have to check that. But anyway, um, you can take water from any of those places. It's still going to freeze at zero, melt at 100, expand when it freezes, do all the same things that that water does. Pure substances, that's just how they are. They have the same characteristics and the same composition, no matter where the sample comes from, and no matter how big the sample is. Because those are what kind of properties? Intensive. Okay. Okay, so when we talked about mixtures um, earlier, we, we, and we actually said this in the, in the summer preliminary work that you did, you can't always tell a mixture by looking at it. It's not always possible to look at something and know that it's a mixture. And milk is a good example. If you landed on this planet from someplace else and somebody handed you a container of homogenized milk, would you know that that was made of different kinds of stuff? Or could that all be milk atoms? Yeah, as far as you know, it could be. We have to know something about it to know that it's a mixture. Um, it's not always evident. So, the big thing with mixtures is that they can be physically separated, and we do that based on differences in their characteristics and their properties. There are four methods listed here for separating mixtures. So manual separation is not something we can really do in a chem lab. So if I mixed some salt and some sand in a container, could you physically separate it? Could you pick it apart? grain by grain by hand, you could, you'd go insane though. You'd tear out all your hair and you'd run screaming. Um, we don't usually do that. You know, the example I, I give, my favorite, tastiest example is if you give me a bowl of Skittles and chocolate chips, I will be happy to manually separate them for you. You can pick out all the good parts. Um, we don't usually do that. Magnetic separation is one that you probably used in physical science. Did you do a magnetic separation? You get salt and a magnet, salt or sand and a magnet, and iron filings, and one is magnetic, one is not. Okay, we're not going to do that here either. The two that we are going to use in this lab are filtration and heating. And to separate something, you've got to have some difference in their properties. If something has all the same properties, you can't separate it. So you're looking for difference. Difference is the way to get in and separate them. So let's do an example. Okay, I have substance A and B. These are just magical compounds that I just created. And they're solids. We want to separate them. We've got a mixture of these two. We want to separate them. And we're looking at a solubility chart and it turns out they're both soluble in water. Can we separate them? How did you, you separated the salt and sand by mixing them with water, running them through a filter, the sand isn't soluble, it stays behind, the water is, it runs through. Could you do that with these two? Why not? So what are you going to end up with? Where are they going to be? Okay, you're going to end up with an empty filter and filtrate water with A and B dissolved in it. So this doesn't get you any place. Well, what if I told you that we could look at solubility in other compounds. So, solubility in alcohol. What if A is non-soluble in alcohol and B is soluble in alcohol? Do we now have a way to separate these two using filtration? Yeah. If we, if we put them in alcohol, B is going to go into solution. When we pour it through the filter, we're going to be left with a filter full of what? A and we're going to have B in alcohol in a container. Um, this, this difference in solubilities comes into play uh, 
There are a lot of things that are soluble in long chain organics like gasoline that are not soluble in water. So grease is a good example. Um, if you've ever had the chance to change wheel bearings. Mm. Now, what you're not supposed to do and what I grew up doing and you're nodding your head, so I'm guessing what you do is you take the old wheel bearings. They're packed full of dirty, nasty old grease with all kinds of grime in it and you need to get that out. And you drop them in a bucket of gasoline and you swirl them around and you manipulate them with your hands and stick your hands in a known carcinogen um, until all of that grease comes out of the bearings and ends up in solution in the gasoline. You're not supposed to do that. That's what we always did. Um, because that grease is soluble in gasoline. It's not soluble in water. You can put a glob of grease in water and it's going to stay a glob of grease in water. You know that they don't mix. So we have to have some difference in solubility. Let's think about the next case scenario. So now we've got two other compounds, C and D. And boiling point is also sometimes called uh, vaporization point or heat of vaporization. It's the point at which something goes from being a liquid, well, it's the point at which something transitions to the vapor phase, goes to being a gas. Um, so if C, so we've got again a mixture of C and D, they're both solids, and at some point presumably they will melt, and at some other point presumably they will go from being a liquid to being a gas. So what if C has a boiling point of 75 degrees Celsius, and D has a boiling point of 150 degrees Celsius? Is there a way to separate those two based on boiling point or vaporization point? How can you do it? I'd say 76, but yeah. Heat this mixture above the vaporization point of one of those chemicals. It's going to turn into vapor. It's going to disappear into the atmosphere. Now, if you want to capture it, that's another problem. But yeah, if you heat this stuff up to 76, you have now driven off C and you're left with D. Convenient. So now let's, let's look at a slightly thornier issue, and this is basically what you're going to be looking at in this lab tomorrow. So we now have compounds A, B, and C. And they are all soluble in water. Oof. There goes one plan for separating them. We can't we can't dissolve them in water and filter one of them out. Except A is not soluble in alcohol. Actually, I'll fill out the characteristics. There are our characteristics. So, your task is to design a method to separate these three things. The flow chart that you have in your lab is a way to visually sketch out your method based on characteristics. So we're going to create a flow chart. So we have A, B, and C all mixed together. And we need to do something to it. So our options, based on what's presented, well, first of all, we know that dissolving them in water is not going to separate anything. They're all soluble in water. So we can just scratch that right off. There will be no dissolving things in water. But we've got a difference in solubility with alcohol. We've got a difference in vaporization points. Okay. What are your thoughts? Got, okay. Okay, so we've got a, a rough methodology here for doing the separation. There are other methodologies we can use. Um, this gets us started on another one. There are some drawbacks here, but we'll talk more about that tomorrow.